the next speaker probably requires no introduction for many of you. This is Professor Mary Shepherd, who's a professor of cardiovascular pathology here at St. George. Um, she's a former president of the European Association for Cardiac Pathology, and she's also recently published the third edition of her textbook, Practical Cardiovascular Pathology, which, which, which I'm told, yeah, it's available in all good bookshops. Um, so welcome, Professor Shepard, and thank you for speaking today. Right, so I'll pop up my talk. Right. OK. Now, sorry about this. I'll just pop back in the end show. And I share, right? Yes, right. yes. on the win on screen, yeah? Yep. How's That's that? Um, yeah. We can see your desktop now, Prof. Yeah, you can see my desktop. Good. See that? Yep. Right. Well, thank you very much and lovely to hear Greg as well and be in contact and you, Chris, for shamelessly, I'm glad to say, plugging my book. But uh, as I've said, I've been interested in sudden cardiac death now for over 20 years, and this emphasizes through cardiac risk and the young, the number of people who die, young people, 12 each week, which surprises a lot of people under the age of 35. But look here, even in the year 1632, the diseases and causalities of death, you can see that 62 people died suddenly, even in 1632, it was highlighted, even though the majority of people died for either old age or infection, but suddenly is even then in the 17th century. Now, through CRY, the cardiovascular pathology unit was set up because people realized that there was a gap in the pathological investigation of these sudden deaths. Pathologists were busy people. The autopsies that were done were not done probably to the standard we are now expecting. It has improved over the last years. So because of this, they set up a specialist. So we only handle hearts in our department at St. George's, which transferred from the Brompton in 2010. Now, what we do is we receive hearts from all over the country. We book it in and we guarantee to give an answer in two weeks, which is way more than where they are done in general pathology departments where autopsies are given very low priority. So we will issue a report within 14 days, sending it to the coroner and to the referring histopathologist. And what's important, which Greg already referred to, is that we tell pathologists please keep a bit of fresh spleen for genetic analysis, the molecular autopsy, as he so beautifully highlighted. And this is what I want to emphasize. The message is now getting through to pathologists. And we always say, please send the heart if you can, or the histology from the heart if you cannot. So looking at the whole heart, which is referred by courier to our hospital, and in addition, a very small piece of fresh spleen for genetic analysis. This is important as we highlight to the pathologist for the sake of cascade screening of the family, as Greg already mentioned. Now, what is our role as pathologists? Well, obviously, as already mentioned, you eliminate other causes, non-cardiac, neurological, respiratory or drugs. Once you eliminate those, with positive or negative toxicology, when it's negative, you go on to say, well, it must be cardiac if no other cause can be found. And they can be divided roughly, as Greg already mentioned, into the morphologically normal heart, which he has referred to as the SADS, sudden adult death, or there is a cardiac abnormality identified, be it a cardiomyopathy, which is also genetic or non-genetic, like ischemic heart disease, although under 40, familial hypercholesterolemia must be considered. We get referrals from throughout the United Kingdom and even Scotland and Wales as well. And there are guidelines now issued by the Royal College of Pathologists as to what you should take when you do an autopsy. In other words, no pathologist should say that he cannot or she cannot take tissue at autopsy. 
using our guidelines, which we've now updated to 2021, a pathologist should be able to take tissue for both the histology of the heart and also for genetic analysis. There is no reason why he cannot take it at the time of autopsy. You do not need consent of the family. You simply need the consent of the coroner to do it at the time of the initial autopsy when you suspect that there is a sudden adult death or there is a cardiomyopathy. So guidelines are there to help pathologists. And there's international as well as the European guidelines, which I have been involved with in my European association. And now there's guidelines in Australia, not so much in America, where there is medical legal issues that they do not actually encourage guidelines because of the medical legal implications. Now, what do we do at autopsy? When the heart is normal, we will take at least seven to 10 blocks of tissue from a normal heart because the heart may be absolutely normal to the naked eye, but there may be microscopic abnormalities, for instance, such as a cardiomyopathy or myocarditis. So we routinely take seven to 10 samples at autopsy, even when the heart looks normal. And this I emphasize to pathologists, even though the heart is normal, there may be underlying cardiomyopathies and abnormalities and inflammation within the heart. Here are the routine blocks of tissue that we take. We tell families when we retain the tissue that the size of the tissue block is out of a 50 pence piece. So the family are not thinking that we're retaining a whole heart when they wish to have it returned for burial with their, with their deceased relative. And this is a very good point to emphasize to families when you retain the tissue, it's a very small piece of tissue for blocks and slides. And families are very happy to give their consent to retain the blocks and slides, as well as the consent for the taking of the genetic material, which has to be obtained after the coroner is finished with his or her investigation of the case. Now we have within St. George's built up an extensive database. And in this database, which is on the dendrite system, we take the history, the age, the sex, the body weight, family history, previous ECGs, previous imaging, heart weight, heart measurements. We photograph the hearts, we do histology, and we issue a cause of death. All this is stored on our centralized database of all cases that we have referred to our department. Now this shows over the last 7,000 cases we have built up, which is the largest post-mortem autopsy series in the world. And you can see there's a pretty, you can say normal distribution. The peak is in the 20s, 30s and 40s age group into the 40s. So in the prime of life is where you see the majority of referrals, but you can see under the age of five, particularly sudden infant deaths, and even into old age, up to our oldest being into their 90s. My oldest hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was in a 95 year old female. So even over the age of 60, one can get sudden adult death as Greg has also highlighted. Now, what are the causes of death in our database? Well, SADs make up over 50%, 53% are sudden adult death. Obviously, we will have a referral bias to our database from the United Kingdom, where other causes such as ischemic, which is the most common cause in the general population, will not be referred to us. The second most common cause is cardiomyopathy, making up nearly a quarter, 22%. Third, is ischemic heart disease 9%, but obviously we'll only be referred a very small number of ischemic cases in which the pathologist is either uncertain of the ischemia or is wondering are they young and familial hypercholesterolemia may be involved. Congenital heart disease still figures as a cause of death, valve disease, myocarditis makes up only a small percentage of sudden deaths, 3%, hypertensive heart disease, 2%, Aortic, particularly aortic dissection, 2%, generalized vasculopathies, 1%, and other cardiac, rare and wonderful entities such as tumor, and conduction disease, particularly Wolf, Parkinson, White, or Block, making up 1%. 
So SEDS makes up a very prominent over 50% of our referral database. And here, male and female, again, you will note here in our database that males predominant in all entities. For SADS, cardiomyopathies, ischemic heart disease, hypertensive heart disease, valve disease, even in myocarditis, and aortic disease. So the male gender predominates for all entities in sudden cardiac death. And this is what Greg already referred to, the incidences in different populations. And as you can see, it can vary from 43 down to 26% and even 23% in our previous study in sports. So it varies with the age and the population sampled, but it can be dramatic from 19 up to in our series 50%. Now, the SAD study shows Look, diagnostic yield, as Greg already mentioned, because we get genetic material of Brugada syndrome after sudden death. It is the common main diagnosis is Brugada among our SADs, which I think both Greg has referred to and Elijah and others will also refer to. Right now, 75% of our 7000 cases make up normal heart SADs or cardiomyopathies. In other words, 75% of all cases referred to us have a possible genetic basis, be it morphologically normal heart or a cardiomyopathy. This is the message getting through to both pathologists and cardiologists. So this is very important. And there has been European recommendations for integrating genetic testing into multidisciplinary management of sudden cardiac death, as already mentioned by Greg. And this message is getting through as this histogram highlights the amount of cases we have got with hearts in red and spleens in blue over the past, you could say, almost 10 years of the existence of our actual referral unit at St. George's. We only received 21 spleens in 2013, but in 2021 we received 306 spleens and even now in 2022 on in April already we've nearly 100 spleens coming with the hearts. So in other words the message is coming through to pathologists more and more of them are referring the heart with the genetic material. So the actual protocol of the molecular autopsy is now well established in the investigation of sudden cardiac death and this is going out to pathologists more and more are referring spleens. So I think in the future we will have a lot more molecular autopsy results, which I'm looking forward to seeing in the future. And you can hear, as Greg already mentioned, about the genetic medical services, Northeast, Southwest, East, Central and South, these areas which have genetic centers and we're going to correlate with the pathology coroners and the inherited cardiac centers and these are the groups throughout which at the moment we're working on to initiate the referral of the sub cardiac death onwards with the genetic material and the screening of the families in these seven different districts which I'm sure Elijah will talk about further. Anticipate average case per region will be three to four cases per month 36 to 48 cases per year. So not a large burden for each individual region. And the role of the coroner and the pathologist will decide, the pathologist will decide, does it need a detailed cardiac examination? And the pathologist will determine the cause of death and send a pathology report. Now, these are the areas. So in other words, the multidisciplinary approach to sudden cardiac death with a coordinator in each region, with a cardiologist with expertise in the inherited cardiac conditions, the geneticists, genetic counsellors, the pathologists, with the specialist nurse and the general practitioner, all working together in the individual regions. Now, what are the inclusion criteria for the pathologists when they have to consider that there is a possible genetic cause? Well, already mentioned by Greg, the morphologically normal heart. In addition, 
cases of unequivocal or uncertain borderline findings like mild mitral regurgitation, mild coronary artery disease, mild dilatation of the heart. All this is a case where it should be treated as a sudden adult death because the results show that there is similar genes to the channelopathies. In the cardiomyopathies, hypertrophic, dilated, arrhythmogenic. Also, if you have an unexplained cardiac hypertrophy, when there is no history of hypertension, when you have an unexplained cardiac fibrosis or scarring, is very important. Also, severe mitral valve prolapse, because that is a possible genetic etiology, particularly in young people under the age of 40. Thoracic aortic aneurysm with rupture, again in people under the age of 40, because again it may be familial. And other very unusual conditions, particularly in childhood, idiopathic calcification of infancy, metabolic or storage cardiomyopathies. Toxicology will always be required and should be negative in these cases. So again, you may accept people over the age of 60 where it's absolutely confirmed that autopsy. So age should not be a barrier to diagnosing these cardiomyopathies. And even in SADS, 40 to 60 years, when there is a normal autopsy, negative toxicology and a family history. Very, very important. And again, in thoracic aneurysms, when it's diagnosed with autopsy and there is again a previous family history, as Greg has mentioned. Right. You can see here age is not a barrier because even over the age of 35, not quite half of one third of our cases are over the age of 35 for SADS. Again, in cardiomyopathies, over 50 percent are over the age of 35 and obviously ischemic heart disease, elderly population as well as valve disease. And even in young people under the age of 15, SADS can be found in children. As the pattern changes with age, already mentioned by Greg, we find that SADS predominate in those under the age of 35 in our database, where SADS becomes a lesser entity in over 35, with cardiomyopathies becoming more manifest in the older population. Now, the normal heart at autopsy, as I said, can only be diagnosed if one does macroscopic examination as well as microscopic examination. That's very important to eliminate any underlying etiology such as myocarditis. And here is the utility of postmortem genetic testing. And here is my book in which I give the criteria pathologically for the diagnosis of the individual cardiomyopathies mentioned here, because believe it or not, pathologists disagree about what is a cardiomyopathy. What is idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy? What is restrictive cardiomyopathy? What is obesity cardiomyopathy? What about diabetic cardiomyopathy and histiocytoid, very unusual cardiomyopathies, as well as the usual dilated, hypertrophic and arrhythmogenic. We have set down guidelines and even with my European group at the moment, we're establishing further guidelines and an international basis. Among the cardiomyopathies that have been referred to our database, the predominant entity, surprisingly, is not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but idiopathic hypertrophy, which I will talk about briefly. 32% of our cardiomyopathies idiopathic, where we've hypertrophy, but we do not know the cause. The next entity is arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy here, making up 19% of our cardiomyopathies, followed by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, making up 18%. In other words, arrhythmogenic is neck and neck, similar incidence in our database. And then dilated comes in as number four. And then Obesity cardiomyopathy related to obesity as with an obese population increasing, I think will become a very interesting entity in the future, which is presumed to be acquired to obesity, but perhaps it's also got a genetic component. And 5% are metabolic, particularly in childhood. Here is an example of dilated cardiomyopathy with a dilated chamber. As you know, the histological findings are non-specific, may be related to toxic, particularly alcohol, 
but 30 to 40 percent are genetic in etiology. Here is in sports, which Gerardo Finocario has done. We find hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but already mentioned idiopathic hypertrophy. We diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy based on histology. In other words, myocyte disarray has to be present significantly at a microscopic level in the left ventricle to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Idiopathic hypertrophy looks exactly the same to the naked eye, a big hypertrophied heart, but there is no myocyte disarray. And this is idiopathic hypertrophy. And as Chris Miles, while he did his PhD on arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, published in circulation on establishing that in sudden death, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy in the majority of cases involves both ventricles, not just the right, but the left ventricle with scarring and fat on the epicardial surface of the left ventricle. And it's really a very important study highlighting that arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is a biventricular disease and can even phenotypically mimic dilated cardiomyopathy when it's actually advanced and the chamber dilates and becomes thin walled. What about obesity cardiomyopathy? That's where the heart weight is greater than 500 grams in males, 400 grams in females in an obese subject. And look, you can see a lot of prominent epicardial fat in the right and even the left ventricle, but there is no fibrosis. There is just simply hypertrophy of the myocytes. And here's an example of one with extreme fatly infiltration into the right ventricle with hypertrophy of the left ventricle and obesity cardiomyopathy. We're seeing it as a very important entity, increasing in incidences. Is it genetic? Is it acquired with obesity? And my fellow Joe Westerby is working on this at the moment. So seven pilot sites have been at the moment underway. And we're hoping and looking forward to exciting findings throughout the country in sudden cardiac death in the United Kingdom where there will be a panel of pathologists in each region helping and then referring on the heart and the spleen to a central regional genetic center and to an inherited cardiac center. And here at St. George's with my cardiology colleagues, we will help with this. And I think we're in Southeast London and I'm looking forward to in the future exciting results from throughout the United Kingdom. And I think it's exciting from both the regional genetics, the cardiologists and the pathologists and coroners. It's a united effort. And I think it's an exciting stage we are at, at the investigation of sudden cardiac death. And I thank my colleagues, including Chris, Joe and Gerardo, who have done a lot of work with Sanjay Sharma and Michael Papadakis in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for an enlightening talk as, as always. And we very much hope you could um, stick around for the panel discussion. Um, yes. I'm sure we'll have a few questions for you. 